consciousness. Okay, we're rolling. All right, this is an interview at Division, Mili Division of Military Naval Affairs Headquarters, Latham, New York, 29th of June, 2007, approximately 1.15 p.m. Mike Russert and Wayne Clark are the interviewers. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Full name is Raymond Frank Manley. Date of birth is Troy, New York, March 8, 1948. Okay. What was your educational background prior to entering service? Um, high school grad. Uh, uh, was out about a year and a half. Uh, didn't go to college. I was just working in that, kind of trying to make up my mind what I was going to do, and then got the famous letter from Uncle Sam. Mm -hmm. Where I got drafted. Okay, when was that? Um, that was, well, my actual report date was March 8th, 1968, my 20th birthday. And that's when I started my military career. Okay. Uh, so you were drafted into the Army? Right. Where did you go for basic? Um, went to Fort Dix, New Jersey for basic. From basic, went to Fort Eustis, Virginia for AIT. What was your MOS? Uh, my MOS at the time was 67 November, which is a Huey mechanic. And how long was that school? That was a, at that time, I think it was a 12-week school. And how was that? Yeah, that was pretty good. I mean, you know, I was 20, not doing it, you know, mm -hmm. enjoyed it. Uh, just to back up a little on it, I was originally drafted for two years. Got to the reception station in Albany, and they said, uh, you know, you do the battery tests, you know. And they said that my mechanical background was pretty good, and I had always tinkered with cars and stuff like that. So they said, you know, because of your mechanical background and that, we have these schools open, and uh, one of them was helicopter mechanics. So, you know, it sounded, you know, because it was 1968, you know, Vietnam and everything, so I said to myself, well, that kind of sounds better than, you know, riding in a you know, helicopter over the jungle instead of walking through the jungle. And the only catch to it was you had to take a third, a third year. So I went from one day being U.S. to the next day being a three-year RA, so, which turned out to be pretty good. I got to go to school. I went on a buddy system with a guy from Saratoga. His name was Bob Fish. And uh, we went through AIT, well, actually we went through basic and AIT together, kind of on the buddy system. And mm -hmm. then from there, he got orders for Korea, and I, got order, I stayed stateside. Once I left AIT, in about August of 68, I uh, went to Fort Carson, Colorado. Served there until, I believe it was October, November of 68. We were standing, I was working on aircraft doing mechanical stuff and we were staying in formation one morning. The first sergeant announced that anybody that wanted to get on immediate flight status to come and see him. And that's really one of the things I wanted to do was to get on flight status to fly as a crew chief, not just be a ground mechanic. So I <clears throat> went in and talked to him, kind of knew what, what was going to happen. What actually happened was I was transferred to a unit at Fort Riley, Kansas. And that was the 238th Aerial Weapons Company that was getting ready to go to Vietnam. So we formed a unit at Fort Riley and uh, between November 68 to uh, March of 69, and on the 17th of March, 1969, we went to Topeka, Kansas, got on C-141s and flew as a company to uh, Vietnam. Uh, in Vietnam... Where did you land in Vietnam? Uh, we actually landed in Cameron Bay in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Actually, the whole route was... I know we got off in Guam, and I can't remember if we did a stop in between. We almost would have had to, I think, but... Guam and then to Cameron Bay. From Cameron Bay, we, uh, we went by Chinook to An Khe, which is in the Central Highlands between Pleiku and, and uh, Quinn Yang. It, it was the home of the first cab for a while, and then uh, we moved into it with other units. What were your initial feelings when you got into Vietnam itself? The, the heat? The well, that, that, was the, that was the big thing, because being at Fort Riley, Kansas, in the winter, you know, the winds just blow all the time mm -hmm. at Fort Riley, and it was it was cold on the flight line. And we, we, you know, 14 or 20 hours later, we get off the airplanes at Cameron Bay, and you walk off 
down that ramp and the, the heat and humidity just hit you in the face. It was, you know, um, really unbelievable at the time. But like anything else, we acclimated to it and mm -hmm. we did pretty good. But I was a spec four when I first went to the unit and then just before we went over, the, uh, the unit promoted like five or six of us to spec fives. So I actually went to Vietnam within sight of a year actually joining the military as a spec five or an E5. Because at that time we still had all the specialist ranks that went from E4 all, all the way up to, I believe, E9. And then you still had your hard strikes, which were your, you know, basically your command, you know, your platoon sergeants and stuff like that, where specialists were the crew chiefs and the mechanics and stuff like that. So about three months into um, flying with 238th Aerial Weapons Company, because the whole company went over together, that means the company would have left together also a, a year from that date. So what they did was they took about a, a third or a little more than a third of the company in, in what they call the d -row shuffle. They moved this to other units. So um, three months in, so about May or June, I ended up, uh, got orders to go to the 7th, 7th and the 17th Air Cab in their C Troop. And that was the unit I finished up in Vietnam. And that's how I got into flying uh, Aero Scouts too, because it was an Air Cab. So I went from Huey's, which was still my primary MOS, so 6 November, 68 November, uh, yeah, 6 7 November, to uh, flying a little bit in the Loaches, which were the uh, 086s at the time, because we didn't have 58 yet. 58s came in country about 1970 or something. So I was a 6 7 Victor along with that, which was the Loach mechanic. Did you uh, come under fire at all when you were in Vietnam? Um, I had a, a couple times. Um, <clears throat> one of the moments that I, I mean, normally we would receive fire, return fire, stuff like that, because when I was with the 238th Aerial Weapons Company, one of our main jobs was between Anke to play coup was convoy cover. So we went from Anke to play coup, and there's a famous pass in, in that area called the Mangang Pass. And um, we would receive, you know, fire from you know, the jungle doing convoy cover because they were trying to hit the truck convoys and stuff like that. The Mangang is kind of famous for there's, uh, I want to say it's either 500 or 5,000 Frenchmen buried in, in that pass that the Viet Minh um, attacked. And the legend or the story goes that we got that all those uh, French soldiers are buried standing up facing France. And on, on one hillside, there was still their unit patch, like, which I don't know who maintained it even at that time, because mm -hmm. you're talking about the early to late 50s, and then we're there in the 60s. So the time spans 10 to 15 years. But uh, one of the times that I remember the most was when in the air cab. It was the last flight of the day. I was flying CNC, which is command and control, uh, in a Huey, and we had a hunter killer team, which was two loaches and two Cobras. We, my unit had Cobras. We didn't have Mike or, or actually Charlie models at that time. So the loaches reported that they wanted to check out a cave, and we said, okay, we'll stay with you, and the rest of the troop was on their way back. And we're doing our circles, the loach goes in, and then the next thing we see is um, basically a fireball coming up off the mountain. The loach went in and crashed. It, got, it, it actually received ground fire and crashed. So we called the troop back. And in the meantime, as we're waiting for the troop to come back, my uh, aircraft commander at the time, we come off to a, what we called a, uh, like a, uh, it's a ridge type landing where you get one skid on the ridge and then one skid still in the air. So at that time, my door gunner and the co-pilot got out of the aircraft. Myself and the pilot stayed on the aircraft. We kept flying and, and giving suppressive fire and stuff like that while the, the door gunner and the co-pilot went to hopefully rescue the crew or see what happened to the crew. And because when he said that he was receiving fire, we were flying right over the top of him when he went in. So we saw this 
what we thought instantaneous fireball, and actually what it turned out to be a, kind of a late delay. They had already hit the ground, were out of the aircraft when the aircraft exploded. So the, uh, the pilot, the observer, and the, and the tour, which is the guy in the back of the six, everybody was fine. I think the only thing that might have happened to one of them was they might have sprained an ankle. But we had it all taken care of before the, the whole troop came back. But uh, that was one, and then we had another time where, uh, not quite the same thing, but we had a, um, one of the uh, Hueys go down, and we went in, flying CNC again, we went in and got the crew out for that. So for the first incidents, and I didn't know about, I, I, I got a couple of awards out of it, and I didn't know about the awards until I got back. I was presented with a uh, Distinguished Flying Cross with a B device, and an Air Medal with a B device. I also have 12 more air medals on top of that, plus various other awards. But my, my whole experience in Vietnam, especially at being 21 or 20, I, mean, I turned 21 in, in country, I was kind of, kind of the old man at, at the time because I was, pilots I was flying with, some of them were 19, you know, 18, 19, 20 year old. And, uh, so I, I was what I consider a little more level-headed than some of them, you know. And, but you know, my experience went fairly well, and you know, other than a couple times, and you expect that, you know. One of the villages we went in was supposed to have been a pacified village because this was during the Vietnamization pacification program, and we put our troops because with an air cab you had a you had a platoon of 28 to 32 infantrymen that we would put on the ground, and then if they couldn't take care of the situation, then we would bring more people in. But we put them on the ground, they checked out, because we were, we were basically invited into this village by the, by the mayor of the village, the chief, and everything was fine on the ground. And then we were the last aircraft out, and as we were taking off, we received fire. So it was one of those deals where, yeah, the village was pacified, but the surrounding area probably wasn't. Mm -hmm. Somebody got ticked off because we probably destroyed a, um, like a rice cache or something like that, and they weren't real happy about it. But you know, the extent, like I said, the extent of my stay in Vietnam was, for me, it, it was pretty good. I mean, what about your base camp? Did you ever get rocketed or we mortared? Got, we got hit a couple of times, but one of the interesting things about our base camp was we were at Lane Army Heliport, which was maybe. 20 minutes west of Quinn Yon, which was a major city. It was a major East Coast city. Um, about the size of, and activity of what Saigon was at the time. On our perimeter, our whole perimeter was controlled by uh, South Korean troops. And Iraq troops were pretty, pretty tough at the time. So we hardly ever received any enemy fire or anything like that. Once or twice, they would do something harassing fire and stuff like that. For, for pretty much our our uh, heliport was pretty secure. The, the thing that we did a lot was the 173rd up at LZ English, they got hit constantly. We were their kind of their main gunship support, so if they got hit, we would scramble to go to English and, and help them out. And that was kind of our AO, the, on, uh, the Onlo Valley, and that area was our area of operation, so we spent a lot of time in the valley. What were day-to-day -day conditions like? Um, what kind of living quarters did you have? What kind of food did you have? Well, Lane, we had really, we, for the way most people live, we lived really well. We were in two-story wooden hooches. Um, we, most of the time we came back every day, we slept in, you know, in our hooches and stuff, and they were the standard government issue bunk beds, stuff like that. We had wall lockers. We had laundry facilities. We had showers. You know, every once in a while we would, get, we would stay out in, in the AO, but for the most part we were back. So our living conditions compared to some of the other guys, you know, were really good. We would pull perimeter guard every so often or somebody would, if you were E5 and above, you would pull either sergeant of the guard or, or uh, CQ, which is tr charge of quarters, stuff like that. We had um, we had an NCO club, we had an officer's club. They stayed open until about 10, 
the kitchen would stay open about 10 o'clock at night. The club itself would stay open at 11 or midnight, depending on if there was a show or not. Our mess halls were pretty good. Our mess halls were still run by the Army at that, that time. They had um, civilian KPs, so we weren't, we, we weren't pulling KP like you know you would. Stateside, you were still pulling KP, but in Vietnam, you weren't because they had civilians that were doing it. They had a lot of civilian help. So our living conditions were, were pretty good compared to some of the Now, areas. being a mechanic, did, were there any problems with the aircraft over there while they were over there? No, excuse me, no. Um, every 25 hours on a Huey, there's, a, there's a, an inspection. Every 100 hours, there's a, um, there was a 100-hour inspection where the aircraft actually came into the hangar. It was pretty well stripped down. All the access panels were taken off. Everything was, was looked at, uh, hydraulic servos. Every major piece of the, of the aircraft was looked at because everything is on a time change say 750 hours for an engine, 700 hours or 800 hours for a transmission. And so you're, you're basically just looking for, uh, like on a transmission, you're looking for cracks and stuff like that. I've had, when I was flying B models, I had a B model that developed the crack in the transmission and stuff like that. And, so, and that was my day-to-day -day job too. Mm -hmm. My day-to-day -to -day job as a crew chief slash door gunner was, you went down to the flight line first thing in the morning and made sure that your aircraft was ready to go. Make sure it was fueled, all the oil levels and fluid levels are up, you know, are up to um, up to date or you know full. And then you made sure that the aircraft itself was ready to go. And that sometimes included making sure that your two door guns were ready to go, that you had enough ammunition for the door guns, that you had water on board for the crew. And I had a door gunner that would help me do a lot of that stuff. So we. Uh, we worked pretty good as a team. I had two or three door gunners that were really good. Now most of those guys were not aviation. They were basically former 11Bs or infantrymen that had been there. I had one guy, he'd already been in Vietnam a year. He served a year with the 101st Airborne and then he extended six months to become a door gunner because at the end of, he was a two year draftee. At the end of that six months, he would be out. He, he got an early out because he volunteered for another six months, so it worked out pretty good for for those guys. But I had a couple that were really good. And now did did they, <clears throat> your crew pretty much stay together? Or yeah, I had two. I had two main uh, uh, aircraft commanders. One was a CW two uh, Richard Carroll or Dick Carroll, and then the other guy was a CW two Jeff Harridge. Those were my two main aircraft commanders, and then you would, the uh, co-pilots would swap out. You would get different co-pilots uh, a lot of different times, and then, and that was when I was flying slicks. Once I went to Huey or went to the CNC section, I flew with four pilots, four pilots only, and that would be either, uh, like, Mr. Carroll came into that unit, and also Mr. Heritage did, and then the other two pilots would either be the excuse me, the troop XO or the troop commander. And that's all you flew with, with those those four people. And I had one door gunner at the time, so we had two CNC aircraft. One was in maintenance, one would be flying. And because the CNCs, you flew sometimes eight to 10 hours a day. So it didn't take long for that 100 hour inspection to come up. So we were on a rotating basis all the time. What were your officers like? We had some really good pilots, uh, commission and warrant officers. Um, my platoon leader at the time was a Captain Davis, who was a West Point grad, who, and he was really good. He later became the Troop XO, and I imagine after I left, he probably became, became the Troop Commander, or he moved up the squad, or one or the other. And like I said, you know, Mr. Carroll, and Mr. Heritage were really good. I, uh, those are the main people that I ran into most of the time. Um, there's another guy, he was a scout pilot, um, uh, Bruce Carlson, and uh, I, I keep in contact with him a little bit now because um, he wrote a book, uh, I believe it was called, I don't know if I told you about it now, Red Bird Down. No, I don't yeah, think so. It's by Bruce Carl Carlson, and um, it's a very good book. It kind of is a self-biography of him but there's some, you know, 
I don't know if you want to say fictionalized, but some you know some storytelling that goes along with mm -hmm. it. But it kind of follows his career. But for the most part, um, a lot of the pilots they lived up on one tier, we lived on the other tier. So other than flying with them, there wasn't a lot of in intermingling because everybody was either so busy doing other things or just it, it just didn't happen that way. Did you have much contact with the local people at all? We we did in a way because, like I said, we had a lot of, of the locals that worked on the base. Mm -hmm. We had hooch maids, so each each hooch had like two or three maids and stuff like that. But it's totally different from having contact with those people and then having contact when you're out in your staging area because our staging area was LZ Two Bit, which was a fire base. And the, next to the fire base was a village of Bonsan, and that village, any any time when a cab flew into the staging area, we would set up, and then the villagers would come out and they would set up their little, you know, like umbrellas and stands. They would have cold soda and and, and stuff like that. So that intermingle worked. It it worked pretty good, but you still had to be leery because you're out in your area of operation and. At that time, you weren't sure who was friendly and who wasn't friendly because by day they were friendly, by night they they weren't. You know, so you had to be careful how close you got to any of them and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. What were race relations like in, within the unit? My unit was pretty good. Uh, <clears throat> the aviation community is pretty good about stuff like that. Um, everybody got along as far as you know racial relationship went there wasn't I can't remember of any one time and you know you heard of different things happening especially in that 68 to 70 71 time frame but uh, on our hel heliport it was all aviation so I think that had a lot to do with it because there was more of a equalness because you're flying as a crew now nowadays they call it crew coordination back then we just called it team teamwork you, know, you had two pilots two crew chiefs everybody depended on each other to get themselves from you know through the day mm -hmm. you know, take off in the morning with that crew you're going to be with that crew all day and then you help each other you know while the officers were getting their briefings we made sure the aircraft was good the officers always made sure that the enlisted guys were fed and i was kind of in a senior enlisted myself so i always made sure that the other crews were fed you know everybody Aviation community, everybody took care of everybody else, and, and it's still to this day, you know, that it still works that way for the most part. Did you ever see any USO shows? We we didn't actually see any what you would call US what USO show brings to mind like mm -hmm. Bob Hope or anybody yeah. like that. But we had once a month or sometimes twice a month they would have shows come to the officers club, and at that time. If a show was at the club, then everybody was invited to the show, enlisted and officers alike. Um, once in a while, we'd have one at the NCO club, and same thing. But they're mostly either Vietnamese bands or Filipino ba bands. They, um, I can't remember any one time that we had what we called at that time a round eye band. You know, so, and I, the time period I was there, I can't remember of any any of the big USO shows coming in. in to the area, whether it be on K or Pleiku or Quignan. We were in the Central Highlands, and I don't think it was kind of either down south around Saigon or up north around Way and Da Nang and that. How long were you in Vietnam? I was actually in Vietnam about 11 months. Um, I left in March of 69 and came home in February of 70. My, I was due to come home in March. My father had passed away suddenly of a, of a heart attack. Uh, somewhere around the 10th or 11th of February of, of 1970. So I came home with a, with about 30 days or so would have had left on my tour. I actually had somebody ask me when I got into, because when you get into, at that time you came into Seattle, Washington, uh, I think it was Fort Lewis. Fort Michigan. Lewis, yeah. And then you go through this whole station, station to station, clearing, getting uniforms and that, and then one of the, one of the stations is you, you know, have your orders. And I had emergency orders, and so the the NCO at the time 
asked me if you know if I wanted to go back. You know, and I go, yeah, I don't think so. You know, I had 30 days left. I had made it through the, you know, with only 30 days left without any scratch to myself, and I wasn't going to press my luck again. And, you know, so I, I told him flat out no. <laughs> how how did you keep in contact with people back at home? Mostly was writing, mm -hmm. and then I did have a tape recorder. Um, a lot of us had tape recorders that we either listened to, you know, music tapes on, or we made tapes. But I did kind of. Kind of a funny story to it is, I did kind of get in trouble for it. I got called on the carpet one time to the uh, troop commander's office, and he uh, and he knew me, and I, I had been flying with him for quite a while. And he, he goes to me, he goes, uh, specialist. He says, uh, "When was the last time you rode home?" I said, "I'm sorry. Probably I tried it at least once a week. You know, I, I I assume it was maybe a week or two weeks ago." He goes, "No, it was more like..." Two months ago, he said, "You need to." He says, "I don't care if you just write a bunch of postcards out now and then send them home, but you need to, you know, keep." Because I guess my mother had contacted the Red Cross because she hadn't heard from me, and she was worried. I understand that, you know. So, you know, but yeah, mostly it was letter writing and, and tapes kept you in contact with everybody, and then every once in a while you get a a package, you know, of goodies from home and stuff like that. Does your family still have any of those tapes? You know, I don't. Th I don't know because mm -hmm. my mom and dad have both passed away. If anybody would have had them, they could be. Because my, actually, my older brother has moved into my mom's home at the time. So, if there's any, they could be there someplace. Mm -hmm. But I know when she passed away, um, we kind of went through everything, and I didn't really come across them. So I don't. I'm not really sure what ever happened to any of them. I don't have a lot of memorabilia left myself because, like I said, I came home. On emergency leave, so I had enough time to pack a suitcase, and then all my stuff was left there. So I didn't get a lot of the, a lot of little stuff that it, that I would have liked to have bought home with me. I might have a photo album or two, but that's about it. Now, once you got uh, back to the states, you had your bereavement leave. Where did you go after that? Well, um, what they did was I, I uh, at the time. Because my father passed away and my mom was was pretty shaken up, I, I actually put in for what they call compassionate reassignment, and I ended up being reassigned to the Arsenal Ward, really, because my I, at that time my parents lived in Clifton Park and so did I, so they, they wanted me to stay in the area, and I only had like 10 months left, what I thought was going to be 10 months left on my on my military career, so I did the the, the last 10 months here at Ward of Lead at that, at the Arsenal. I, doing various driving jobs. I ended up, I was the post commander's driver for about four or five months. And in the meantime, I had gotten orders and kind of, as hindsight, kicked myself because I had orders from McDill Air Force Base, which is at the time that they were forming, from what I understand, that's where um, the 160th was being formed at the time. They had something, you know, it was a special operations type of thing, not knowing it, you know, I just, but then that was, well, that was 70. And then 71, I was I ETSed out of active duty, and I had my the other six-year part of the six-year obligation. So I I, I kind of laid low for a while, and then one day I was going by the airport, and uh, saw at that time we had they they had OH 23s and then some OH sixes in Huey. So I you know got the bug again to, to fly and. Uh, found out who the contact, and it was uh, at the time it was First Sergeant Bailey, Pop Bailey, who just about bought everybody into the unit. I think he even bought Wayne in, probably. But um, so I, that was 19, that was January 6, or January 7th, of 1977. I became a traditional M Day soldier and um, started flying scouts again and a little bit of Hueys, but mostly scouts. And then did that for about 10 years as a traditional M day. And then they, they were reorganizing the unit to, um, to an attack helicopter battalion. So in August of 68, no, I'm sorry, August of 86, they, there was openings for AGR personnel, which is Active Guard and Reserve. It's just like being on active duty, carrying active duty ID, you just don't travel. 
So I, I took that position, and uh, in August 1st of 2003, I retired with 30 some odd years total in uniform and about uh, 22 or 23 years for pay. So right now I'm, quote, a retired soldier, even though I'm still working full time as a, now as a state employee. And you retired at what rank? I retired as a first sergeant. Uh, while I was in the Guard, I kind of built myself from being a, uh, a hard strike buck sergeant because they did away with the specialist ranks mm -hmm. and stayed that way for like 12 years because I didn't want to give up my flight position. And then all of a sudden, you could be promoted one grade over, so I made staff sergeant and then stayed as a staff sergeant for oh, probably another five or six years, seven years. And then when I became AGR, that was a sergeant first class position. So I made sergeant first class. And then in 2000, I made uh, first sergeant in C Company with the third of the 142nd. And then a year after that, I took over headquarters company. It was a 250, almost 300 man company. And I finished out my, my uh, time with them. And I retired. My actual retirement day was the 1st of August of 2003 which was, what, four years ago now. Time flies, <laughs> yes, <it> does <laughs> But it does. But, like they say, you can, you, can take, you can take the boy out of the uniform, but you can't take the man out of, you know, out of the army. So I still feel every once in a while that I'm still in it, because, you know, it's, well, when you spend 30 some odd years in it, that's, that's it's your life. Mm -hmm. You know, you... Have you joined any veterans organizations at all? I haven't. I, <clears throat> I'm very busy with family and everything. I just haven't, you know, taken the time to, to do that. I've been approached a couple of times for some of the local American legions and the, the VFW, but I, I no. Nah. Well, I, I should say that I belong. I belong to Nogus, or not Nogus, but the enlisted, uh, mm -hmm. the enlisted council. So I do belong to that. Support it and try to do, you know, different things for it, you know, for the, uh, for the council. Do you ever use any of the GI Bill benefits at all? GI no, I actually, I never, because when I did, when I came off active duty, started a family, working full time, and went into the guard part time. So that that took up a lot of time. So I didn't use any of the education benefits. I've taken a lot of different uh, computer training stuff on my own, or now through the job, I've taken a lot of that. But I n n never really acted on that. I did. Uh, when I did finally retire, went to the county rep, submitted the paperwork for medical, excuse me, disabilities and stuff like that. So I, I actually ended up with like 30% of the disability because of back problems and, 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 uh, and actually asthma that was contributed you know, mm -hmm. from being, it never had it before I went in, so somewhere or another, but they, they say that you can get it no matter where it is or what class mm -hmm. it's so. on. But the uh, you, you mentioned you stay in, in contact with at least one person. Have you, you stay in contact mm -hmm. with them with others that mm -hmm. served with you? Yep. Um, recently, uh, I've made some longtime friends. Um, I consider Wayne a longtime friend, mm -hmm. Joel McComb from the unit, Jeff Melatesta from the unit, Mike Dunn from the unit. Mike was actually our first sergeant for a long time, and I, I basically took over from him. You know, two or three four or five people that, you know, mm -hmm. pilots and, and, and enlisted people that. How about those that served in Vietnam with you? The only, the only contact, it's sporadic contact. I've had contact with Bruce um, mm -hmm. a, a few mm -hmm. times, mm -hmm. with Jeff Heritage, email-wise. I haven't been able to track down um, Dick Carroll, uh, a couple of the other crew chiefs, uh, uh, Bill Martinez, which is a Vietnam guy, even though we had a Bill Martinez in our unit too. Um, and then um, I, I tried to contact or track down like Ken Laffey, who was one of my gunners, and Ron Strickland. I, I heard from Ron a couple times, email-wise, because the Ruthless, Ruthless Riders, which is the, the air cab, that we're in, they have an association, and they, they have a, um, a yearly get-together, a reunion every year. So I, a lot, and I'm um, um, listed with them 
every once in a while I'll get contacts or I'll try to find people by going on the website and seeing But you've never gone to a reunion? No, I haven't because most of the reunions so far have been out in the western part of the mm -hmm. country and it just hasn't worked around my schedule up until, like I said, 2003 with, you know, being a full-time guardsman and doing our ATs and going to Nicaragua, going to Honduras, going to Iceland. It always didn't work out, you know, so I've been waiting for one to come to the East Coast more. Uh, they were talking about Radcliffe, which is down near um, Campbell, Fort Campbell, mm -hmm. Kentucky, so I'm talking about that. So maybe one of these days I'll get to that one. But Bruce was in the area a couple of years ago. Our sister unit, we were the 7th of the 17th. Our sister unit is the 3rd of the 17th, which is at Fort Drum. It's a cab unit at Fort Drum. So he was up there for, and he's also a reverend now, uh, he was up there for some type of uh, celebration or something. So we had been emailing back and forth, so we actually uh, coordinated where he came down this way, because I, I remember right, he was going to Massachusetts. So we met, we met for lunch and we hadn't seen each other. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, 20, no more than 20, almost 30 years. Did you recognize time. him? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and. Uh, so we talked about, you know, things that, you know, we both remembered and, and we talked about his book and stuff like that. So that, that was pretty good. He keeps in contact with a lot of it. A lot of the pilots, because of the pilots associations and stuff like that, they keep in contact because every year there's a helicopter pilot association reunion. A lot of, a lot of, and it's usually on the four, it's usually around the 4th of July. So a lot of guys, and a lot of the pilots do go to that, but even though we have, but there's two, I think, two crew chiefs associations. I know of one anyway. Yeah, and but I don't. From what I've seen of it, they don't they don't have the reunion every year and stuff like that. So um, I haven't really kept contact with that many people. A couple of final questions. Were you ever aware of the anti-war movement back home? Oh yeah, constantly. My parents would send me different things. Mm -hmm. um, I was aware there was a local kid that had gotten hurt during one of the protests and stuff like that. And then when I came back, because that was still 1970, um, the spring of 70, when I came back, when I was stationed at the arsenal, there was a couple times we couldn't leave the arsenal at night because there was there was demonstrations going on at the gate at the arsenal and stuff like that. So they suggested that we stay on post, and that, so we did. Yeah, I, I was very aware of it while I was in Vietnam, because like I said, my parents would, they would send me local newspaper clippings and, and, and whatnot. So yeah, we were, we tried to keep up on it as much as we could, you know, just to keep aware of it. Did you ever read much about Vietnam or watch any of the movies? I just about watch everything that I, that's ever come out, just to, for my own, you know, to pick it apart or see how good they've done it, how, how true to, True to the story, they keep it. I, I've read numerous books on Vietnam. Um, there's a couple of really good ones from For Life Me Now. I can't even remember the titles, but I, uh, Ch well, Chicken Hawk for one is very good, and uh, Guns of Blazing, I think, is another one. But especially anything that deals with aviation, you know, because we know it, we can kind of pick it apart, you know, stuff like that. But for the most part, most of the books that I've read have been they've been true to true to form. If they're a fiction, then they kind of go away from, you know, they just uh, try to, you know, blow it up a little, mm -hmm. but for the most, and, and it's just for pure entertainment, but, you know, for the most part, the, the true stories that I've read have stayed with it. Um, um, I don't know whose book was it? McCain's book, John McCain's book. I, I read that mm -hmm. and really liked that, and different ones. Mm -hmm. And not just Vietnam War. I, a lot of W-2 stuff I mm -hmm. read and Korea stuff. How do you think your time in the service had an effect on your life? It had, it, as far as I'm concerned, it had a very positive effect on my life because um, I probably wouldn't be where I am today if it hadn't been for the military. I still hold a lot of the values that the military taught me to this day and I try to, because of where I work, I try to instill that on the younger soldiers that I, that I work with too. A lot of people still refer to me as a first sergeant and they'll, they'll defer to me on different things because you know, of being in the military so long and, and knowing kind of the, 
I don't want to say the, the shortcuts, but the, the, the way to handle a situation, a way to get things done. There's, there's always an easy way to get things done, or there's always a hard way to get things done. And, and then there's always you know, that gray area where you can get things done and, and still, you know, have things happen the way they should happen. We were given an analogy one time by General Garrett, who came over for an inspection of the unit. And his analogy was, picture the Army regulation as a football field. The football field has boundaries. You can either run straight down the, the football field and adhere to the, to the board of the, of the AR, or you can go within the boundaries of the football field, which still adhere to the AR, but it's not as strict as, you know, as adherence to the AR. So, yeah, well, there's always, a, there's always wiggle room. Because to make to make things happen, sometimes you can't go by the letter of the you know of the law or let, I shouldn't say the law, but of the AR because we deal that's what we deal with you know even in this particular job it's the same thing you have standard operating procedures and as long as you stay within those boundaries you can, you can get the job done everybody's happy. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Day.